um, or leukemia. Um, but then again, I think it's run amok, and there isn't enough regulation um, over these dispensaries. And so that is my, my position. They do not need to be near our families or our children or seniors. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Well, for the support of medical marijuana, uh, for those that need it, uh, I also oppose uh, or having them open so close to one another, and and also not near schools or parks. Uh, what you know, in talking to constituents, I, I talked to a family where that they're right off of Valley near one of the dispensaries we're talking about, and his concern was that his children play. It's a it's a, a cul-de-sac. And that's where the children play. And he was saying, because you know, folks just wait there to get their stuff, they come and they smoke it in the cul sac and then my children can't play out there. So uh, two things. I think we have to really get ahead of the game. Unlike our liquor store problem, we have to address the zoning issues and, and strictly regulate uh, the proximity to, of, of these dispensaries to schools and to parks. Uh, I mean, that's really, I think, the only thing we could do. And also maybe increase patrols to uh, to make sure that people are not hanging out outside illicitly uh, yes, you know, getting marijuana. Thank you. Ms. Uh, I think that um, Ms. Diaz said it correctly, it is run amok. Um, there are really tremendous problems, and of course you have a councilman who hasn't responded to any of them. In particular, I was shocked when we saw about the trade show that they had at a warehouse in Boyle Heights that ran a trade show in marijuana. Um, and when we called his office, because we were concerned at that time, he claimed to have no knowledge, no information, or anything that went on. And very frankly, many people in the community had to bring it together and make sure they closed down that so-called trade show, which they were hoping to operate every weekend, in which they were going to buy and sell all of this medical, medicinal marijuana. But I think at the end of the day, I think Ms. Diaz is correct, it is run amok. The next question, we're going to start with Mr. Chavez. This question is by a stakeholder, Nancy Wyatt. What do you foresee as pluses and minuses of a minimum wage proposal? What do you see as pluses and minuses of a minimum wage proposal? As a union, as a union organizer, um, I, I'm, I'm strongly in support of raising the minimum wage to a minimum of fifteen thirty-seven an hour for all workers in the city. Uh, I think we've talked about the affordable housing crisis. We've talked about rent burden. We've talked about families having to pick between medicine, food, health care, uh, their children's tuition. So we we have a serious issue when we we are out of all the major cities in the United States, we're the one with the lowest wages. So that's a challenge we have. Uh, the positive would be that if we raise everybody's wage, obviously people spend their money locally. So we're going to have more money going to local businesses. On the negative side, it's how do we mitigate the impact on on small employers that, you know, unlike the larger corporations, won't be able to handle. Um, you know, the increase to their operating costs. So I, I believe that that's where the tax breaks to the to the small businesses come into play. I, I support the mayor's proposal on um, the minimum wage, which is a gradual increase that allows small businesses to catch up. But I've also said that I really think the mayor has to call a all of the regional mayors together. I think this is a minimum wage increase that has to be throughout the region so that we don't have businesses that will move out of our neighborhood and going to Vernon or going to Burbank or to Downey, but instead will continue to have the vitality here. Uh, we have too many, many families that just can't afford to live on minimum wage. It is really should be the action of the Congress, but they're not moving on it. And it should also be the action of the state, and they're not doing anything about it either. So people are impatient, and I appreciate that the mayor has put forward the proposal that I think has, has the vitality and the support of many people in the community as long as it is a graduated effort, and then more importantly, that it become a regional effort. Thank you. I support the minimum wage um, increase. I do support the mayor's um, proposal for this. Um, I do agree it does have to be gradual. Um, work productive, work productivity has increased, but the wage has, has stayed at a, a, in my opinion, stagnant. So if work productive, work productivity has increased. We need to increase um, the minimum wage so there's more spending and um, it, the 
requires um, more business. So in that regard, um, I believe my, I concur with my colleagues that we do need to um, set that example and work towards that um, in order to provide for our constituents. Thank you. Our next question will be, uh, we'll go to, to Mr. I'm sorry, to Ms. Molina. Back to Ms. Molina. This question is by Teresa Marquez, who is an active community member. It is, the question is, Boyle Heights is the epicenter of environmental health issues. 250,000 people are exposed to high levels of toxic chemicals like lead, benzene, and arsenic. What have you done, or what do you plan to do to support the community fighting to close Exide Technologies? Well, I have been one of the people leading the battle, along with many of the others in Boyle Heights. What we've done is we've stood firm and strong that we need to close down Exide, that Exide can't you know, continue to have a permit. They've had a temporary permit for decades. And very frankly, they're not putting enough dollars in place to really clean it up. They tell me they've added a couple more millions to, uh, to the cleanup. But very frankly, when we look at what the potential cost was, is I think that the governor should not be approving any, um, any permit whatsoever. The DTSC has not done their job. And very frankly, what Royal Height needs is a strong, smart advocate who's going to pose the plan to continue with Exide in near Royal Heights. Thank you. Um, Exide, it's, it's tremendous. It's a health hazard. It's been there 80 years. Um, our families are impacted by it, not just in Boyle Heights, but the surrounding community. Um, in the early 1900s, the state voted um, uh, unanimously to make sure that all manufacturing and industry is located on the east side to preserve the west side. Now, we need to make changes there. I know that's going to be a long haul. But in regards to Exide, how I have been involved as a community advocate um, with other organizers, and there are several in this audience. Ms. Marcus has been the lead on this. Um, and unfortunately, our incumbent has not been around. Um, health is not, a, is not a grave issue to him or a concern. And Exide, as I can tell you, there are children and seniors and mothers and fathers with sicknesses that should not, should have never occurred. So what we can do as a community is unite, mobilize, strategize, and organize ourselves to fight this. I'm disappointed with the governor. Thank you. Governor's uh, approach to this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chavez? I, I concur with my colleagues here uh, that we have to shut down the excite plant permanently. Uh, their temporary permit should be revoked. Uh, but I also think that we have to, uh, to create more green spaces. Uh, Boyle Heights, which is the example that was raised, uh, we sit right in the heart of the East Side Interchange. Uh, you know, in the, in the 2014 City Health Atlas report that was, that was uh, published by the City of Los Angeles, if you look at the communities that were, that were most impacted by environmental health issues, it's uh, San Fernando Valley, South Los Angeles, and the East Side, which is East Los Angeles, Boyle Heights, and all of our communities in CD14. So uh, I, I believe that if we're going to be allowing any other uh, technology companies or companies that are dealing with toxic chemicals, similar to the Clark's Fund, we should uh, be charging them some type of, of uh, revenue generating uh, fee that's going to use, be used to offset uh, the, the negative impacts of, of, uh, of the toxins. Thank you very much. This question will be posed to Ms. Diaz first. I'm sorry. I'm going to punch you. Yes, that's the last question. Ms. first. Okay, yes, so Ms. Diaz. Okay, fantastic. Sorry about that. The city of LA has had one of the worst 911 communication divisions in the country. They take more than the four second average to answer a 911 call. What will you do to fix this? The question is yes. The city of Los Angeles has had one of the worst 911 communication divisions in the country. They take more than the four second average to answer a 911 call. 
<laughs> what will you do to fix this? 45 minutes, I think sometimes it's two hours in our neighborhood. I'm not sure what it is here. Um, I think we need to work with the department in a better system and a better plan. Um, possibly increase um, more staff to take care of this issue. Obviously, it is a problem. There are some communities that get rapid response. Um, and unfortunately, it's not in our districts, maybe in San Marino or Brentwood, but not here in El Serino as well. Um, working with the different departments, um, creating a, a, a program um, to implement strategies in order to get a better response time, working with LAPD and all the other uh, law enforcement um, departments to do this. That's what I stand. And also engaging the community to make sure it happens. Thank you. Mr. Travis? I think first we would have to look at causes of the slow response time. I, I don't know if there were, you know, staff cuts during the economic recession to that department or not. But I think we have to look at the causes of the slow response time, invest in improving the system. When I was looking at the budget numbers, 52% um, of the city's budget goes to police, uh, police officers or the police department. Um, what percentage of that is actually going to the 911 uh, communications division? So I, I think we have to look at all those factors and obviously ensure that that we're to par with other great cities that are responding uh, within that four second average. Thank you. Ms. Lee? Well, of course, 911 isn't just about answering the phone, it's about answering the issue. And so it goes with the whole issue of how you're going to budget. So yes, regrettably, during the downturn, they did cut a lot of essential services whether it be inspectors that you want, whether it be LAPD to respond to you. So it isn't just about the communication system, although that always needs to be upgraded. But very frankly, what you need is you need to have the money in a budget that makes sure it's addressing all of the essential services, particularly emergencies. Thank you. This question is for Mr. Chavez first. What is your plan in housing homeless people in CD14, including veterans? What is your plan to house homeless people in CD4 to including veterans? I think uh, that's, where the, that's where replenishing our affordable housing trust fund comes in. Uh, there's, all, there's a partnership between Alley County and Alley City in addressing uh, homeless, homeless services and homeless issues. Uh, but I think we have to make a, 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 a real effort to, to house these, uh, these people. Unfortunately, you know, I, I feel like our city has turned a blind eye uh, in dealing with, with issues, dealing with homeless people. Uh, veterans, unfortunately, our, our veterans are coming back. Uh, they're not, in, you know, they might have some mental health issues that, that they have to address, and for that reason, they're out in the streets. So I think we have to per, uh, build affordable housing with support services and ensure that, we're, that, we're, uh, that we have a robust outreach program. A lot of homeless people are not going to come and seek services because they have mental health services that they do need. So I think we have to proactively uh, reach out to those populations and ensure that we're getting them the, the mental health services and health services and housing services that they deserve. Thank you very much. <laughs> Again, I think you can create services, but I don't think you need to house all of the homeless here in CD14. In fact, there's an over-concentration of, of services in CD14 that all of that is going on on Skid Row. Very frankly, it needs to be regionalized and pushed out. I think there's too much of it already. Um, there are ways that you can create programs, like Judge Pregerson's program that I've worked with him, where it is over by the city of Bell, where they took an old armory and is working there and providing not only shelter beds, but providing counseling and drug abuse, and then getting many of these people back on their feet and, and stabilized. But very frankly, right now, the biggest issue is that CD14 is having to accept all of the homeless, and it isn't across the board throughout the cities. So I think we need to enforce the law and not allow as many of them to be here within this district. Thank you so much. Ms. Diaz? Um, homelessness. Um, I'm a social worker. I worked on Skid Row at the Alley Mission um, um, years ago, in 2006. And I was with the medical team. I saw different target populations, women, children, seniors, veterans, um, transgenders, 
um, all types, and there's not one band-aid for all. We need a system of care and a treatment plan um, that, that addresses the needs of the target populations. I agree with uh, Ms. Molina. We cannot house all of the homeless, um, homeless people here in our community. We have to share the wealth and the problem and fix the problem. Um, veterans. Um, I graduated from the USC School of Social Work. Um, Dean Flynn, who's very active, she works with Washington, D.C. in regards to developing a model for the veterans. I have a veteran right here in the audience who's also a social worker. We need to reach out to those who specialize in regards to taking care of the veterans and work with the professionals as it pertains to their needs or any need um, other than veterans. It could be drug addiction, mental health, um, geriatrics. There are geriatric populations on Skid Row who are homeless, and we need to take care of them. We really, really do. And it's devastating for all of us, and we need to help them. Thank you. There are, I only have five more questions that we will get. Okay. I'm sorry, four questions and a closing. 